tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Why BC will require two vaccine cards, one to travel and one to eat out. Also. Uh, he punched me in the head, uh, threw me to the ground. Alarming trend, stranger attacks on the rise in Vancouver and. Well, I would be really proud to be able to hand you over this, uh, this check. $70 million richer. A Burnaby woman claims the largest Lotto Max draw in BC history. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So Ottawa has lifted its blanket warning against all non-essential travel outside of Canada. The Prime Minister also announcing a standardized federal proof of vaccination card to travel outside of the country. We are very confident that this proof of vaccination certificate uh, that will be uh, federally approved, uh, issued by the provinces with the uh, health information for Canadians, uh, is going to be accepted. Most provinces and territories have signed on and have already made them available. Here in B.C., you'll need to carry two cards, depending on what you're doing. The B.C. vaccine passport is still needed for restaurants, concerts and other non-essential activities. And now also you'll need the federal card to travel internationally. That document will come online for British Columbians by the end of the month. And a restaurant in hope may now be beyond hope that it can defy COVID vaccine rules and stay open. This afternoon, a judge granted an injunction against the venue. The move comes as another eatery has been ordered to close in Vancouver. Dan Burrett joins us with more. Dan, let's start in the Fraser Valley in Hope. In, indeed, Rowley's restaurant had stayed open in defiance of a closure order issued by Fraser Health for not checking customers' vaccine cards. In court, Rowley's co-owner Marlene Abeling argued the injunction application ought to be delayed for two weeks because she had less than a day to prepare and no time to find a lawyer. She also claimed the injunction was unnecessary because Rowley's wasn't a COVID danger, according to her, and challenged the constitutionality of the vaccine card program itself. Fraser Health said the injunction application was about Rowley's refusal to stay closed, not whether it ought to be forced to check vaccine cards. It's already fined the restaurant more than $1,700 before it sought this injunction. Meanwhile, Kitsilano restaurant Corduroy was ordered closed yesterday for a second time after repeatedly defying COVID restrictions. The city suspended its business license in April after it ignored indoor dining restrictions in place at the time. On social media, Corduroy says in part it will, quote, strategize how to best move forward without jail time. BC's public safety minister says businesses ignore injunctions at their peril. And if they're smart, uh, they will follow the provincial health orders. If not, uh, they may well find themselves uh, uh, in even, you know, more trouble than just having their business license uh, pulled. Meanwhile, the owner of the Blue Grotto nightclub in Kamloops is reaching out to patrons after a concert last week. He says at least seven people at last Thursday's Belvedere show have tested positive for COVID. He says just over 50 people were there. He notes none of his staff have tested positive so far, but he's asking anyone who attended that concert to get tested. It's noted Interior Health has not declared an outbreak at the Blue Grotto. Anita. All right, Dan, lots to cover there. Thank you. More than 700 new COVID-19 cases today in B.C. Four more people have died, all of them from Northern Health. That region has 172 new cases, plus the second highest number of active cases at 937, despite being home to only 6% of B.C.'s population. Across the province, there are just shy of 5,000 active cases. 377 people are in hospital. 136 of those are being treated in intensive care. And BC Children's Hospital is seeing a growing number of kids to its emergency room with cold and flu symptoms. Over the last month, nearly 30% of all emergency visits have been for respiratory-related illnesses. That's 10% more than it would have been in the same period pre-pandemic. The illness includes respiratory syncytial virus, a common cold which usually causes a mild illness. But the hospital warns symptoms can be more severe in infants under six months old, especially those born premature who or who have chronic lung or heart disease.
Well, it's an alarming trend. Over the last year, there's been an increase in the number of unprovoked stranger attacks in Vancouver. As Janella Hamilton tells us, the assaults range from women out walking to a man punched after a bus ride. It's a sight that brings Ray Sue peace as he tries to heal. A victim of a horrific assault that happened in 2017, Sue got off a bus in Vancouver and a stranger punched him in the face. It was disorienting, discombobulating. The feeling of just trying to um, stay on your feet when um, you're being thrown to the ground. Sue is just one of a growing number of people being randomly assaulted. 1,550 attacks in the city since September of last year. Obviously, as police, we're in the realm of public safety. That's our uh, mandate. When we notice this type of trend, we need to report on it. 28% of the suspects identified in the last year appear to have mental illness. 47% of the cases involved weapons and 28% of the victims were female. This is the first time the VPD had pulled data on unprovoked stranger attacks, so it's hard to say if the numbers are going up or down, but more than four people a day are being attacked by someone they don't know, and that's concerning for the VPD. It's definitely not something I'm going to forget. It's absolutely, it's in the back of my mind all the time. The attack happened in broad daylight right here at the corner of Main Street and King Edward Avenue. And while the assault happened four years ago, Sue says it's something he will never forget. After going public with his experience, Sue says he was inundated by messages of support from people who said they wished they could have helped. And now he's trying to help others. But one thing is clear. Counselors say the trauma after an unprovoked assault sticks with most victims their whole lives. They can develop and they can progress in anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations, if, um, especially if help is not arranged in a timely manner. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police are investigating after a man walked around downtown brandishing what appears to be a gun. He was seen Tuesday morning around 10 a.m. As you can see here, he's holding and pointing what appears to be a weapon. He's also alleged to have been making threatening gestures. He was walking north on Granville Street near Nordstrom before going inside Pacific Center Mall. Whether real or imitation, the VPD considers this a concerning threat and it's appealing for witnesses. The man is described as white, roughly 50 years old and 5 feet 8 inches tall with short curly black hair and a dark goatee. He was wearing glasses at the time. A pedestrian has died after being hit by a semi-truck on Highway 1 in Abbotsford. Police say it happened in the westbound lanes between McCallum Road and Sumas Way at around 11 last night, and the road was closed for four hours. Officers are still working to confirm their identity. The driver of the semi stayed at the scene and is cooperating with investigators. ICBC says nearly half of all incidents involving pedestrians happened between October and January. Canada's Supreme Court has ruled people can sue cities over snow removal activities that cause injury. The case prompting the decision is a lawsuit brought against the city of Nelson by a woman who injured her leg while climbing over a snowbank in 2015. The city argues that the woman should have known climbing the snowbank was dangerous. But the court disagreed, saying it was the city's job to clear the snow. If it had done so, the injury could have been prevented. Well, a Campbell River whale watching guide has been fined $10,000 for purposefully getting too close to an endangered pod of killer whales. Nicholas Templeman's boat was seen approaching a killer whale within 35 meters near Willow Point in May of 2019. Templeman acknowledged over a radio that he was aware of the presence of the whales. Despite his acknowledgement, he positioned the boat so that the whales would have to pass him in close proximity. He's now been found guilty of violating species at risk and federal fisheries acts and has been fined $5,000 for each violation. Well, this week, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth celebrated 30 years since he was first elected to the B.C. legislature. Since first winning the riding of Port Coquitlam, he has served as MLA for all but one term. And in a rare moment of nonpartisanship, a member of the B.C. Liberals shared a few kind words today. I think the book would be a matter of honor. The, uh, the 
honor that he has shown for his uh, constituents uh, through those uh, three de decades and serving them, the honor he's shown to this institution. And uh, the honor I think we all feel, hundreds of members, past and present, who have uh, had the honor to serve with him. On uh, <clears throat> this, your political birthday, uh, congratulations, Mike. You don't look bad for 30. <laughs> I believe some tears were shed as well in the legislature. A nice moment for sure of nonpartisanship. Congrats to a long career for Mike Farnworth. Okay, a Burnaby woman is $70 million richer after buying the winning lottery ticket at the spur of the moment. Christine Lozon initially stopped by her local shopper's drug mart just to buy a pack of peanuts. Now she's come forward as the winner of last month's huge Lotto Max jackpot. The $70 million payday is the largest prize in BC history. And to keep track of her newfound fortune, Lausanne is working with a financial advisor, but she plans to gift some of her prize money to family. I was a little nervous, uh, but with those things, i tell you the truth. Probably sure of the small things first and probably let it let this settle a bit. Lazan wants to help causes that are close to her heart, where she will make an impact. Now, the odds of winning the Lotto Max jackpot are one in more than 33 million. <music> Meteorologist Jenna Wagstaff is here now. Um, and Joe, perhaps storms are your sort of lottery jackpot? <laughs> 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 that's very funny, Anita, because if that's the case, I have hit the jackpot <laughs> this week with three storms moving in, uh, each one potentially stronger than the next. Now, I know that wasn't uh, everyone's cup of tea today, especially across the island where we did see some big impacts. I want to take you to the latest pictures from earlier today where uh, we have seen some big trees down uh, leading to a couple thousand without power across Vancouver Island, particularly on the north coast through the day today, but we even saw a couple of big trees down around uh, Port Renfrew, Souk and Victoria, again, leading to a number of power outages on the south end of the island. Uh, it was great news for surfers though. These uh, waves and winds all courtesy of a weakening remnant of a, a typhoon. The center actually sitting well off our coast, but we're still getting the impact just to show you how big this is. So a quick look at that radar right now. It's really just getting started for metro vancouver it's going to be a wet overnight most of it happening overnight for us and a wet uh friday morning before we get a bit of a break but there it is the center of that swirling low continuing to bring strong winds tonight to the north coast and high to Gwai. that's where wind warnings do remain so we may still see some widespread powder power outages okay so that's the wind the rain the third aspect of this story today the temperatures it was downright balmy in metro vancouver hitting 18 degrees at YVR, 19 for the North Shore. Seasonals for this time of the year are around 12. So you can see even as we lose the sun, keeping hold of some very mild temperatures. Uh, we've got a couple more pulses of moisture to get through over the next couple of days. But uh, keeping on our storm track in uh, lottery, Anita, it looks like the biggest one is actually going to come Sunday night into Monday. This one does have potential to be a fairly significant event. So I'll break it down for you. Got all the uh, latest model details coming up. Okay, we'll talk soon, Joe. Thanks. You're welcome. And the snow hasn't started to stick yet, but BC Mountain Resorts are looking ahead to the winter season and once again courting U.S. travelers now that the border is open. Destination BC is launching its marketing campaign focused on snow seekers in Washington, Oregon, and California. The campaign is aligned with Alberta and Quebec tourism. Now, at Big White, the push is to open the Kelowna Airport to international travelers. They're our backbone. If you look at Heli, Cat Skiing, and, uh, and, and Whistler, Big White, Silver Star, Sun Peaks, Revelstoke, Fernie. These are all very, very important customers for us. And now that Destination Canada, Destination BC, and, and our resorts are all working together to spend dollars down in California, Oregon, Washington State. And we're, we're opening up the welcome carpet. We're inviting the tourists back. He says U.S. travelers typically spend three times as much as their Canadian counterparts when it comes to winter tourism. This has a lot to do with the value of their dollar, and he says they also love the excellent snow the province is known for. 
Well, Prince George Man's story of addiction and recovery is the inspiration for a new single from a multi-platinum Canadian rapper. As Andrew Curiata reports, the pair is using the song to raise awareness for money for people struggling with similar issues. It's a story that connects an award-winning rapper in Los Angeles to one of his biggest fans in Prince George. Big C, a man by the story by the fan of mine. Slowly we became good homies after a span of time. Kick it every time I Whose life story inspired a new song. And Chris Vigu still can't believe it's actually happened. Absolutely surreal. It's uh, a dream come true. For years, Vigu was a familiar face at shows put on by Swollen Members, a multi-platinum Vancouver rap group who dominated the charts in the early 2000s. Eventually, that fandom turned into a friendship with group founder Madchild. Uh, I went to every single concert that came through our city, and uh, each time I went to a concert, I got to get a little bit more of Madchild, you know, meeting them backstage, uh, getting a hat signed. Uh. He would go out of his way to... Um make it a, a great experience every time I came through and played in the city of Prince George. But at the same time, both men were struggling with addiction. Vigu had been bullied as a kid and turned to drugs and gangs to cope. Didn't feel safe in my own neighborhood, right? That's not right. Meanwhile, Madchild says he spent more than $3 million on an addiction to painkillers, which nearly killed him before getting sober. I had it all and made mistakes and seen a fortune blown. A struggle he's opened up about in his music. Vicky also got sober, starting a family and career, but only recently shared that story with Madchild. He just started spilling his guts and telling me his story. And I was so blown away. The rapper was inspired to write a song about Vigu's journey in the hopes it would help others. Vigu says he was nervous about going public with his addiction, but he's already been contacted by people who say they are seeking help after hearing his story. The song saved the guy's life. He said, I, I was going to take my life this morning and I heard the song and, mm. and I'm here because of your song. Right from day one, we just wanted to help one person, one person only, and, and it did. Coming back from addiction is, is the hardest fight you'll ever fight, but it's the greatest reward you're ever going to get in life. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you, my G. I had no idea you went through all that struggle. Now that I know your whole story, bro. Funds from the single are being donated to a local recovery centre. Andrew Curieta, CBC News, Prince George. You are watching CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And there are many ways you can catch our show, including Facebook and YouTube, but also our free app. It's called CBC Gem. Why one family ditched the 9 to 5 and how they're being celebrated as they walk across the country. Plus, some of the pandemic benefits are gone, but a plan to financially support many Canadians has been unveiled. Who qualifies and what's involved is coming up. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. The University of PEI researchers are using some high tech tools to scan island fields and create specialized maps. The goal is to give farmers information to manage their crops more effectively. And as Nancy Russell reports, to also help the environment. This is one of the remote sensing tools measuring electroconductivity by sending electromagnetic signals into the soil to gather important information. Work that started at UPEI in 2017. We actually started this project uh, to establish some basic theories uh, regarding uh, soil electrical conductivity and different soil variables such as soil moisture uh, and soil nutrients. The information gathered by the remote sensing tools is then turned into a special map with different zones in red, yellow and green, each with different characteristics. The PEI Potato Board is a partner in the research. Rather than the same fertilizer rate over the whole field or the same tillage over the whole field or the same seed spacing over the whole field, we can manage that uh, variably within the field. The remote sensing tools also measure how compacted the soil is. In this field, researchers are trying to break up the subsoil in a compacted section to see what effect that will have when potatoes are planted here next year. The project is also looking at different ways to space out the potatoes based on information from the remote sensing. 
in the green areas of a field, you may say, okay, though that's the best area of the field, we can put more plants in that area because that's a naturally more productive area. Sandier soil or doesn't have as many nutrients, so we need to space those out a little bit. There are other high-tech tools, including this drone. Researchers use it to monitor the crops over the summer. And the scientists say there could be another benefit from using less fertilizer. Outside of just profitability for the farmer is the environmental impacts. So if we can, you know, if we can reduce the amount of nutrients going on that aren't being taken up by the crop, that's a big environmental benefit. McDonald says remote sensing is catching on. He says more than 6,000 hectares or 15,000 acres across PEI have already been mapped using this technology. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Central Bedeck. The federal government is making changes to the relief programs that many relied on to get through the pandemic. A new initiative will replace the Canada Recovery Benefit Program. And as Jacqueline Hansen reports, employers in the tourism and hospitality sector will get wage subsidies and rental assistance until May of next year. Christine Eilat is back to work as an usher at several theatres, but pre-pandemic she worked 45 hours. Now she's lucky to get 10. The theaters are largely still empty. All my jobs pay minimum wage, so I'm averaging approximately 143.50 a week income. She's been relying on the Canada Recovery Benefit to help pay her basic bills. I don't know what I'm going to do now that it's ending. I'm I'm totally at a loss right now. The latest available data for mid-September shows about 800,000 Canadians were still receiving the CRB. That's down from more than 1.2 million in January. Now Canadians will only be eligible for support if their work is impacted by a public health lockdown. We're now in a new phase, one that is very different from the darkest days in our fight against COVID. As of September, all the jobs lost at the start of the pandemic have been gained back. But compared to February 2020, more Canadians are working fewer hours. And the number of long-term unemployed has also jumped. Frankly, I don't know why we think we have to reinvent the wheel. The pandemic isn't over. This economist says cutting off support for individuals isn't the answer. The focus right now has to be on creating jobs, not on reinstilling some kind of tough love work ethic. Uh, it's not the work ethic that's the problem. It's a shortage of jobs and a shortage of hours. But the new targeted business support also announced today isn't going to help this chain of 27 restaurants bring more workers back. We can't afford to be able to hire them back. The company doesn't think it's eligible. Revenue is down 30% compared to two years ago, but the new tourism support requires a drop of 40. We are likely to have to close probably between three and five of our restaurants. Still, Eilat is hopeful that eventually, as restrictions lift, her hours will increase and she can go back to fully supporting herself. I love what I do. I love our customers. I love my employers. I don't want to leave. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Pfizer-BioNTech has released new data from phase three trials of its COVID-19 booster shot. The company says it provides very high protection against the virus, including the fast-spreading Delta variant. One expert says there are additional benefits to booster shots. At some point, we will be looking at probably a booster that is better tuned to the current variants. So the, the, the vaccine formulation we have now works well for Delta, 
But as with all viruses, this will continue to evolve, continue to change, and we may benefit from a booster down the road that is just slightly different and able to better align our immune system with the, the variants that are circulating in our community at that time. The trial showed more than 95%, 0.6% effectiveness against the disease. Experts and health officials maintain the level of protection provided by the current course of vaccines is still giving good protection for most Canadians. Though some parts of the country, including here in BC, are offering booster shots to certain populations like those who are immunocompromised and residents of long-term care homes. Over in Saskatchewan, almost one in five of its total COVID-19 deaths have come in the last month alone. Hospitals are buckling under the strain, even as critically ill patients are sent out of province for care. Bonnie Allen takes us inside the crisis tonight. Doctors inside this Saskatoon hospital say it doesn't look like a disaster zone, but with COVID patients stuffed in a laundry room and children's ward, it is one. ICU doctor Jeremy Katolka is on his first day off in a month. You worry that you start to slip and miss things and, and make mistakes that, that could harm patients. So that's really, that's the worst of it for me. Three of Katolka's patients were sent to Ontario this week, relieving some pressure, but not enough. There are 76 COVID patients in Saskatchewan ICUs. New modeling suggests that could more than triple by January if there are no additional public health measures or vaccine boosters. I am really deeply concerned for the citizens of Saskatchewan and what will happen if more public health measures aren't put in place. The, the president of the Canadian Medical Association says it's time to stop asking the government nicely. I think what we're seeing is the system in Saskatchewan really collapsing. I have no shame in pleading to the public that we've gone so far. Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer broke down in tears yesterday, but also came under fire over whether he has recommended private gathering limits. The government won't implement them. New cases seem to be trending down, but testing has dropped too. I think it's really uh, somewhat nonsensical that we have a province that is really the epicenter of COVID-19 in the nation right now have some of the um, lowest level of public health restrictions. The situation is unsafe in the ICUs right now with the number of patients we're seeing and we're not able to offer necessary health services like surgeries. Saskatchewan has already sent six ICU patients to Ontario and today confirmed it will send another three by Sunday. The province has also asked the federal government to send health care workers. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. A new program at the University of Ottawa is turning dissertations into documentaries. The Faculty of Law has hired a filmmaker to help academics turn their research into compelling stories that will be available to the public on a new digital platform. As Sandra Abma reports, it helps that the filmmaker is a lawyer himself. What you're watching is a 400-page research paper come to life. The Right to Farm is a French-language documentary based on the PhD dissertation of University of Ottawa law professor Sarah Berger-Richardson. Berger-Richardson met with small-scale organic farmers to learn about a patchwork of regulations and laws that are hurdles to getting their produce to market. When she published her paper, she feared only academics would see it. Definitely in my discipline, the most standard route is to convert some chapters into uh, different standalone articles to be published in a peer-reviewed journal um, and read by maybe experts in the field, but at this point probably not read very widely. That's where Etienne Trepanier comes in. Trepanier is the law school's new filmmaker in residence. He's also a lawyer who uses his camera to translate complex research and legal issues into stories the general public can understand. We have to start with a good research, but then find tools and, and, and approaches to be able to take out from that research the essential portion, the message, the heart of the message. Trepanier and Berger Richardson say the public has the right to know about academic research that could affect their lives and livelihoods and hope other universities adopt similar programs. So I think we're, we're really leaving the era of academic information being kind of locked behind, um, you know, paywalls to get that information. And we're seeing the importance of open access 
The Right to Farm is streaming on the faculty's digital platform called Jury Vision, available to anyone who has an interest in food safety, distribution, and animal welfare issues. Sandra Abma, CBC News, Ottawa. Workers at a warehouse in Calgary have announced they are joining one in Edmonton. It's an attempt to do something that's never been done before in North America, unionize the workforce at Amazon. But as an investigation by the Fifth Estate has revealed, the e-commerce giant has been accused of using questionable tactics to stop workers from their efforts. Workers at this Amazon warehouse are one step closer to unionizing, but unions in Amazon have a rocky past. And it's not just Amazon's workforce, but even companies that do business with Amazon, like drivers in Toronto who had a contract to deliver Amazon packages, about 170 a shift. It's the volume. It's like it's so much pressure to finish these parcels. You gotta go, go, go. This former driver believes Amazon called the shots at his company. No time for breaks, little or no pay for overtime hours. When he pushed for a union at the company, he says their employer had a warning. Amazon doesn't like unions. If you guys like push for this union, like, you know, we might lose our contract and then no one has a job. The union vote never happened and TK was fired. At another Toronto delivery company, more than 75% of the workers voted for a union. But eventually the company closed down in the middle of bargaining and, and, and they declared bankruptcy. And you think Amazon was behind that? I do, yeah. There's clearly an allergy to unionization. Author Brad Stone says Amazon's anti-union stance stems from company founder Jeff Bezos. He looked around at some of the traditional U.S. automakers and, and, and other retailers whose workforces were unionized, and he judged that they've limited the company's flexibility to innovate. Union now and union forever! After an aggressive and expensive anti-union drive from Amazon in Alabama, the no vote won by a two-to-one margin. Now the battle shifts to Alberta, where signs have already gone up, urging workers to question the cost and effectiveness of a union. I think it's a very challenging place to organize. Because of the nature, the, the precarity of the job, the power of Amazon, um, they're, you know, they're an incredibly powerful company and there are fears of reprisal. In a written response to CBC News, Amazon says our employees have the choice of whether or not to join a union as a company we don't think unions are the best answer for our employees. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch The Fifth Estate on CBC TV at 9 p.m. and it's available streaming anytime on GEM. She's walking thousands of kilometers across Canada and taking stunning photos as she goes. Those images have earned international recognition. We meet her next. Here at home, the Prime Minister was on the road again and on turf a bit friendlier than he found in New Brunswick last week. Mulroney was in Burnaby, just outside Vancouver, where he was speaking to a minority these days, his supporters. It was the second stop on the Prime Minister's current cross-country tour, and he pulled out all the stops to attack his enemies and defend his record. Our chief political correspondent, David Halton, reports. While the Prime Minister says his goal here is to listen and learn, he spent his first day in Vancouver cheering up Tories. At a meeting of B.C. Conservatives, Mulroney broke the ice with some humour. But I know that uh, we're at tough times. I know we're in some difficulty. I called my mother the other day. She promised to call back. <laughs> Mulroney's message to the Tories here was to hang in there. Because, he said, voters will be a lot more positive about the government's record in two years' time. Mulroney claimed that Canadians won't elect Liberal or NDP governments in Ottawa because they would spend the country into deep trouble. And he took one shot after another at Jean Chrétien. The reason that the little guy from Shawinigan presented himself as a candidate in New Brunswick is he couldn't get elected in Shawinigan. That's the reason. Mulroney also took aim at the Reform Party whose growing strength in the West has a lot of Tories here worried. At a policy workshop earlier today, one Conservative delegate even proposed that the government should respond by adopting Reform Party policies. Why, uh, why fight the Reform Party? Why don't uh, co-opt its platform 
and make it our own and therefore capture the votes that we will lose to them. But Mulroney said he doesn't accept the reform platform, especially its proposal for an across-the-boards cut in all federal spending. If it's a 15% across-the-board cut that he says, that's 15% out of old age pensions. And that's 15% out of mother's allowances, and it's 15% out of Medicare, and 15% out of hospitals, and 15% out of education, and I'm telling you, that's not good for Canada. One unusual feature of Mulroney's three-day visit is that he won't be meeting with B.C. Premier Bill van der Zam as he has on past visits here. Mulroney says he'd be happy to meet with the Premier to discuss B.C. problems, but that van der Zam simply hasn't asked for a meeting. David Halton, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Wind warnings are in place for several parts of coastal BC. The Central Coast, the Sunshine Coast and parts of Vancouver Island could see winds ranging from 70 kilometers to 110 kilometers an hour. High to Gwaii gusts could reach Category 1 hurricane levels at 120 kilometers an hour. Strong winds can throw loose objects and break tree branches, so you're being asked to take caution. Uh, threw me to the ground um, and there were a bunch of people who were also there at the bus stop um, and they didn't intervene. Vancouver police say there's been an alarming increase in unprovoked stranger attacks. It's working out to four more random assaults a day compared with last year. More than three quarters of victims have been male. A Seashell woman has been named a finalist for a National Nature Award. In 2019, Sonia Richmond and her husband set out to hike 24,000 kilometers of the Trans-Canada Trail. The journey is still going strong, and this nomination is just the latest in accomplishments along the way. Sonia joins me now from Quebec. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. Sonia, what an incredible journey so far, and still lots more to go. Tell me about how this all started. Well, we were working desk jobs and we did not enjoy sitting at our computers. And we also had a younger relative who was struggling with a video game addiction. So between those two things, we decided to sell our house, donate most of our possessions to charity and try and get out there and reconnect with nature. And we were hoping to inspire others to do the same thing along the way. Well, and so tell me more about that video game addiction, because I know a lot of this, like you just said, has to do with inspiring youth. So how have you been able to do that so far? Well, we're just sharing our story as we go. We're reaching out to people through blogs, and we've done a lot of presentations in classrooms and with campers, with young kids, just encouraging youth to turn some of their screen time to green time. And we're doing that through citizen science and through birding. And so far, the reception has been phenomenal. Well, and you know, you look at some of the photos you've taken on this journey, it's clear you have a deep love for birds. Have you seen anything so cool you just never imagined it existed? Oh, so many things. <laughs> um, some of our favorites right now, um, we've, we're seeing these huge flocks of snow geese flying over. We were in Saskatchewan a few weeks ago and they were flying over there. I know they're flying over Seashelt right now and they're here in Quebec. So it's one of the things that's connecting us coast to coast to coast. And it's just, it's absolutely amazing. You've been going a few years now and you've gotten a letter of support from the prime minister, but what is one thing you say you can reflect on here that others can take advice from, especially those who are stuck in a rut? I think one of the, the biggest lessons we've learned is Canadians from coast to coast to coast are absolutely fantastic. They've showed us enormous kindness and generosity. Strangers, people we've never met before have helped us along the way. We never would have gotten this far without 
the kindness of strangers. This is a, a wonderful country. It is beautiful. And if you get out there and discover it for yourself, you can only fall in love with it. I can imagine those human connections make it all the more fulfilling. Sonia Richmond is hiking across the Trans-Canada Trail, helping others connect to nature through birding and hiking. She's a finalist for the Canadian Museum of Nature's Inspiration Awards. Thank you. Thank you very much. As piano competitions go, it doesn't really get any bigger. How one Canadian musician won the Chopin competition next. At 6.39, a live look at Victoria tonight. It was a balmy day for late October with temperatures well above normal. But guess what? Stormy weather is on its way and Johanna has a look at all of that next.
Canadian has won one of the world's most prestigious piano competitions. Montreal's Bruce Liu came out on top in the International Chopin Piano Competition in Poland. As Alison Northcott reports, the 24-year-old beat elite musicians from around the world. Bruce Xiaoyu Liu's playing has been described as elegant and jaw-dropping, and it's earned him first prize in one of the world's most prestigious piano competitions. The winner of the competition is Bruce Xiaoyu Liu, Canada. Winning can be life-changing, opening doors to an international career. Being able to play Chopin in Warsaw is, is one of the best things you can imagine. Liu trained at the Montreal Conservatory of Music and the Université de Montréal. You can see the reaction in the hall. It's like a, a, a st standing ovation. I never heard like that. One of Liu's teachers is a previous first prize winner himself and says Liu's playing is filled with imagination and fantasy. A lot of charisma in his playing and with such kind of intensity that he keep the audience like a breathless. Part of Liu's development happened here at the Montreal Conservatory of Music. It's what you dream as a pianist, it's what you dream as a teacher too, you know, because we work in the background a lot, like, but we're there all the way, you know, through their development and their growth. When the competition was last held in 2015, Montrealer Charles Richard Amelin placed second. As much as it, it is taxing, uh, it's, it's, it's such a boost of energy and, and, and uh, adrenaline, you know, going through that experience. The win brought him international attention and performances around the world. He continues to do concert and teaches at this university. It's a great thing not only for, 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 for him, of course, but for the future of uh, think of mu music in Montreal and music education in Montreal. For Liu, after the intensity of competition, he's looking forward to a break. So I'm happy to be finally be able to sleep and party. <laughs> and what an accomplishment he has to celebrate. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. You can play just as well, right, Joe? Yeah, more like three notes on a xylophone, but... Uh... <laughs> Not, no, not quite. <laughs> I've got Mary had a little lamb on the piano. That's about it. Hey, that's not bad, Anita. Yeah, well, I was going to say that we should take some of that intense piano music and overlay it over some dramatic footage. And I have just the thing that'll match. Uh, let me show you the latest live shot. We've been sort of checking in on the La Palma eruptions each night. It's been going for over four weeks now. And just seems to be the timing of our show when we get the most dramatic eruptions. This is happening live. Now imagine dramatic piano music over top. Uh, we are still seeing that eruption happen. Uh, 7,500 homes destroyed, but luckily no injuries or deaths so far as evacuations continue to happen well ahead of time. And some good news. Last week I mentioned some stranded dogs uh, being sent some drone deliveries. Uh, just getting an update from locals that those those dogs have been rescued. So We'll keep checking in on those uh, fiery images. No signs of stopping yet. Another great image to take you to, this time a satellite shot of our twirling low. You can see the center just sitting southwest of Haida Gwaii. As we mentioned earlier, that's the remnants of a typhoon tracking across the Western Pacific. If this were to make landfall, uh, so to speak, along the south coast, we would see a damaging wind event. And I know we talked about some power outages across the island. But look how far away the center is actually from land. So it's this kind of setup we're worried about as we head into Monday. We might actually get one of these powerful lows making landfall across the south coast. And through history, uh, we know that this is where we can get widespread uh, trees down and power outages. So I will be following that closely. Watch this one, though, Friday afternoon, getting some clearing tomorrow in through Metro Vancouver. And then we'll see another pulse of moisture for Saturday morning, not coming with uh, too much winds. It's Sunday night into Monday that we've got that third low. Rainfall totals for tomorrow. This is just through to Saturday morning, uh, roughly 20 to 40 millimeters. We'll see some higher amounts towards the North Shore. So creeks and rivers continuing to run high and fast over the weekend. Uh, seeing that rain move across to the interior as well. 11s for Williams Lake, Lona, Cranbrook, a little chillier tomorrow across the interior. Prince George, Fort St. John, Dees Lake, you're all above that system. But Prince Rupert, you're getting the next one, which means 90 kilometer per hour winds for you. Okay, breaking down the week once again. So rain tomorrow morning, sunshine for the afternoon. 
Another pulse of moisture for Saturday morning looks like sun in the afternoon. And then Sunday afternoon showers will ramp up. Right now, the timing looks like Monday morning could be a significant wind event. We'll have to keep our eyes on that land falling low very closely. Obviously, shift in timing. And there is a chance that that low could hit farther south, farther north. We'll be watching that closely. But uh, Anita, it's the earliest that I've seen this kind of model consensus uh, on a wind event like this in some time. So we'll definitely keep you posted as we watch for the sunny break then. Yeah, and that sideways Monday rain, I'm going to have to wear a face shield. Thank you for noting the sideways rain. I had to dig that icon up, so thanks. Yeah, it's intense. <laughs> thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Some hockey goalies in the Northwest Territories are trying another sport to give them a competitive edge, table tennis. As Chantelle Duboc reports, there are lessons to be learned from going from rubber puck to ping pong ball. On your side first. That's it. The program combines table tennis and hockey to improve hand-eye coordination and reaction time. Thorsten Gould is the executive director for Table Tennis North. He got the idea when he was watching hockey at a rec centre and thought his organisation could help young goalies improve their game. When we pitched the ideas to other people that are in hockey, they said, yeah, why not? I mean, it's always beneficial to do extra things. It's not just yoga or aerobics or whatever else, but why not including another sport? Ooh, nice. Yeah, go! The study was done in Hay River last spring. It took six weeks and had seven participants aged 9 to 15. Coaches used a variety of table tennis drills and games for balance and reflexes. It was hard to get started, honestly, I must say, because thinking as a hockey goalie where none of the people from table tennis had any idea what that means like, like angling and so on, that was a bit hard to start with. Then slowly learning, for example, the fun exercises you play with the forehand and then catch with the other hand. That was a, a, a great way to, to increase the the reaction time to increase just eye-hand coordination, everything. And I think that was an aha moment for me, for sure. Deacon Tybring is 14 years old and has been playing hockey for three years. He'd never played table tennis before, but thought he'd give it a try. I think they were really good and improved my overall, like, hand-eye coordination quite a bit. The results showed that on average, participants improved their off-ice hand-eye coordination by 20.5%. On the ice, save percentage improved by 15.8%. Tybring says he saw a difference in his performance and he encourages other players to try it out. Gould would like to see more multi-sports approaches because he thinks it can really benefit athletes. It's great that our kids learn table tennis and we can enhance their lives, experiences, uh, skills. But other sports can do that too. And hopefully this is a starting point for all sports coming together more and more. Table Tennis North wants to bring the program to communities in the Satu and the Delta, and they're working on a virtual table tennis program for classrooms. Chantal Dubuc, CBC News, Yellowknife. Well, you've heard of the Great Wall of China, but have you heard about the Great Wall of New Brunswick? One man's geological tour de force next. Georgia Lewin LaFrance and her slightly older sister Antonia are out for an October training day. They've been sailors since they were kids, but not always in the same boat. We sailed different classes and I was always struggling to find people to sail with. So Antonia used to come and sail with me whenever I really needed a partner. Um, and we actually were really good and we really liked sailing together and that's kind of why we decided to do the Olympic campaign now. They sail the 49er FX class, and deciding to commit to the Olympic campaign for 2024 is a huge commitment. Fresh off a gold medal at last month's Europeans in Greece, they know they're on the right track. It's a good thing to know in the back of our heads that we can be there and we can do that again if we prepare the same way. Oh, it's a huge deal. So do you give a, do you give a time guess? That's Ken Duell, head coach for Sail Canada. The success at the Europeans was a good sign. Next year, another test when the World Championships are held right here. 
This camp we're doing right now is testimony to how great it is. We had the commitment of the entire team to come prepare one of the greatest sailing places in Canada. And uh, to be able to invite the world to enjoy our backyard next year is going to be amazing. We have the 49er, the 49er FX, and the NACRA 17 class. Angela Chisholm is organizing those worlds. We're looking at approximately 50 countries um, and also 200 boats, so that would be 200 teams. They are double-handed, so that's about 400 sailors. Having the worlds in their own backyard is a bonus for Georgia and Antonia. I mean, obviously, you know the venue, um, and I think it'll actually add pressure to know people here and have people ask you, you know, like, how, how's it going? Now to get stronger and faster doesn't just require time on the water and in the gym, but making sure their heads are in the right place. There's definitely a few sister fights. It happens with siblings, it happens with any team, but we have, we work with a sports psychologist a lot. He's and we like have, <laughs> we have pretty, uh, we have preset uh, communication roles and boundaries. The sisters weren't on the water alone. Other members of the Canadian sailing team are here for this training camp. The Tokyo Olympics might have just finished, but the prep for Paris 2024 is well underway. Colleen Jones, CBC News, St. Margaret's Bay. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the achievements and resilience of women with CBC Vancouver's Angela Starrett at the annual Dress for Success Luncheon. Learn more at vancouver.dressforsuccess.org. And CBC Vancouver returns as exclusive media sponsors of the Corleone Men's Choir. Don't miss their upcoming Remembrance Day concerts in November. Learn more at corleone.org. Big John, the, late, the largest Triceratops fossil ever found, has a new owner. Ici, c'est vu. Adjugé 5,500. When the auction bidded, bidding ended, an anonymous buyer from the U.S. paid about $9.5 million for the bones. Big John lived more than 66 million years ago in what is now South Dakota. The Triceratops skull was the first piece to be found there in 2014, measuring two and a half meters by two meters. And researchers say the skull showed evidence that another Triceratops had hit it from behind. The dinosaur's new home isn't known, but will certainly have to be a big one. And in New Brunswick, there is a man who has been collecting rocks for half a century. The stones come from all over the world, and Earl Gilby has used them to build a retaining wall in his backyard. My name's Earl Gilby. I live on Keswick Ridge, New Brunswick, and I've been building this wall for 50 years. Uh, there are stones and rocks in it from all over the world. My customers and people I know really helped me. I couldn't have done it without them. They brought me rocks from everywhere, from the most easterly point in North America, Cape Spear and Newfoundland, to the most westerly point of Europe, Lands End Wales, Venezuela and South America. I just started building it and putting it together, and as it went along, I could see where it could be a kind of a beautiful thing, maybe when it's done, but that's looking ahead 50 years when I started. I had no plans, I just started building, that's all. When I worked with the City of Fredericton as the Parks and Trees Superintendent, uh, they were tearing the, the chimney from the old pumping station. That's down at the end of Smythe Street, next to the river. This 1883 was uh, was in the, embedded in the chimney. And so 
nobody wanted it, so I knew it was a piece of history and I didn't like to just discard it. So we, uh, I took it to my home and just placed it there in safekeeping. And, uh, and uh, then uh, when I come up and met the Gilbys and saw this wall here, it, it seemed like the right place for it because it would be safe and it would be here for people to see. This is the knocker off the door from the old lodge in Fredericton, and you turn that quarter of a turn, and it'll open up. Now that's a secret compartment in the wall. Here's a cobblestone from Toronto. Another cobblestone from Montreal. People get old if they're lucky, and they pass away, and in no time, you never hear their name spoken again. I've always had the idea I want to leave something behind that will last for a few years. So I'm hoping that that wall will stand for a little while. What a neat and nice way to preserve some of those special items and remember so many people. Thanks so much for watching our show tonight. Dan Burrett is here at 11 o'clock after the National, and we'll see you back tomorrow. Good night.